This is the 26th episode of my Exploring Appalachia series. I'm Josh and welcome to Mountain Roots. In this episode, I'm traveling to Jolo, West Virginia. Now, you're only going to know about this place for likely one of two reasons. The first is that you or some of your family are from here, and the second is that you've heard about the Snake Handling Church in this part of McDowell County, West Virginia. I want to be clear from the outset of this episode, I'm not here to ridicule or mock these people. As part of this Exploring Appalachia series, I want to look at the practice of snake handling and also challenge some stereotypes that have been broadly applied to Appalachian people because of it. It is true that snake handling as part of a religious practice or act of faith began to be popularized in Tennessee during the early 1900s by an illiterate moonshiner turned revivalist named George Hensley. He interpreted the biblical text of Mark chapter 16 that reads, They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, as a requirement to prove or show one's faith in God. Hensley would later die at age 74 from a venomous snake bite during a snake handling service, and a local county judge would rule his death as a suicide. As I make my way to the infamous Snake Handling Church, it's worth noting that most Pentecostals have denounced Hensley's interpretation of scripture regarding snake and serpent handling. It's still practiced by some, usually far from the gaze of other Christians and law enforcement. Heck, some will even drink a bitter poison called strychnine as an additional show of their faith. Ironically, six Appalachian states, including Tennessee, where the practice originated, have outlawed religious snake handling on a variety of grounds but then again, these laws of men are merely ignored when it comes to religious zeal. You have to understand that handling venomous snakes such as copperheads, cottonmouths, and rattlesnakes arose in an era of the holiness movement of the late 1800s. That's when Methodists, Anabaptists, Presbyterians, and Quakers were demonstrating their devotion to God by avoiding worldly pursuits like dancing, gambling, drinking, and even attending the theater. Snake handling was just a step further for some, not to worship the snakes, but to show their faith in God to non-believers. Many have been bitten by venomous snakes, and some have even died. Today, snake handling is practiced right here in Jolo, West Virginia under Pastor Harvey Payne. And it's directly tied to George Hensley's with signs following church plants, as you can see on their sign. I'm not making light of the pandemic here, but I find it a touch ironic that they would be concerned about keeping the church safe from this and not venomous snakes. Despite a few churches like this getting all the attention of the media and Hollywood, historically the more common thing practiced across Appalachia was faith healing and home remedies learned from the Native Americans. When people lived so remotely with little or no access to medical care, they only had themselves and their faith in God to rely upon. One old timer said, people, you know, didn't have a chance of running after doctors back in these mountain areas. They weren't close, and where I was raised, it was 12 miles by horseback to the nearest doctor. They got a cut, and it was too bad. They used a turpentine and sugar, or kerosene oil, as an application to kill infection. And of course, kerosene oil in those days was scarce because people had to burn it for light, you know. That's all the lights we had except the pine knots in the fireplace. Some of the old remedies certainly worked, some probably didn't. One lady named Molly Green in the Foxfire book series said about her remedies, if it hit, it hit, and if it missed, it missed. Regardless, the remedies themselves stand as a testament to the ingenuity of an all but vanished people. And if home remedies couldn't lick it, there were usually people who claimed to heal by faith. Unfortunately, today, we're products of an age of convenience, and we're taught to believe things that cost money are better than things that don't. 
These elderly faith healers were quiet, simple, strong, and sure people. They had faith in themselves, but more importantly, faith in their God. And they believed it was through Him that their words carried weight. Unlike the flashy revivalist and even old George Hensley, they didn't heal in tents before crowds of people. They didn't cry out over the radio, and they didn't accept money for their work. Instead, out of a gesture of friendship and concern, they would work with neighbors and neighbors' children when asked for help. Yes, there are still some snake handling churches spread throughout Appalachia in the southeast, but that's probably a hundred or less congregations with likely small numbers of adherents, yet it casts a broad stereotype on Appalachians in general. In the broader scheme of the entirety of the region of Appalachia, it's a very small number of people, yet it gets a disproportionate level of attention and lore. What's more common in these communities are people bonded together by shared experience and local churches, which they rely upon in the good times and the bad for support, community, and guidance. Yellow journalism has made Appalachia the butt of so many jokes, of so much scorn and of so much unwanted and unfounded pity. Sure, there's poverty here. Sure, there are folks who have practices that seem odd to outsiders, but these can be found most anywhere. Some will be poor, some will do things that are bizarre or unfamiliar to your own sensibilities, but people are people wherever you find them. This is why I'm determined to explore Appalachia with an honest cultural journalism that doesn't just point the finger at the small percentage of oddities or warts, but rather communicate and share the incredible people, the stories, and the places that make up the tapestry of Appalachia.